In today's video, we're going to be talking about my favorite opening with white pieces. Can you guess what it is? I mean, technically you don't have to do a lot of guessing since it is already on the screen. But for those of you that didn't catch on it, I'm referring to the Jubaba London. So if you're playing this anywhere below like 2000, it genuinely feels like stealing the candy from a baby. So for today's video, I'm going to be walking you through three model games that I have played. These are going to highlight uh, very important concepts such as uh, typical pawn structures, how to deal with a very annoying pin, and how to also deal with very aggressive pawn push by our opponent. So without wasting any more of your precious time, let's dive right into the action. All right, all right, all right, managed to find another game. I'm going to be trying to hunt for another Jubava London. And uh, okay, opponent plays d5. And then e6, all right. I'm going to go bishop to f4. And uh, we will probably get into very standard lines. Okay, bishop to d6. It is uh, what I like to see. Because uh, it is pretty much taking us towards one of the most important fundamental uh, pawn structures that uh, you need to really get comfortable to like... Uh, become a successful uh, Jabava London player, okay? And I'm talking about E3, right? Like, pretty much just inviting them to take. That is how I want you to deal with this bishop d6 tension in most of the cases. Now, normally they will take, like, according to the stats, about, like, 70% of the times they will take. Now, if they don't, We'll develop with knight f3, bishop d3. This is pretty much the standard way to develop in the uh, Jabava uh, London. So, gonna go knight f3. Giving him uh, the option of <laughs> still entering that fundamental pawn structure that I was mentioning. And uh, here we have it. Pawn takes. Now, first of all, you need to really understand that uh, this is gonna be more of like slow positional game. And uh, I like to call this uh, pawn structure the uh, uh, boa constrictor variation, okay? I just came up with that name because exactly like the boa constrictor snake, uh, well, it is not a venomous snake, so it's not like uh, it's going to kill our opponent immediately on the spot. But it's going to be more of like a slow, but, uh, you know, steady squeeze. And, uh, okay, the main reason for that is because our bishop is more active. So, if black could uh, generally uh, trade the bishops, the position is around balanced. But normally, uh, they just have this <laughs> light squared bishop, which is only collecting uh, dust. So, uh, yeah, understanding to play this pawn structure is like, let's say, uh, having a proper, uh, let's say, uh, grip as a pool player. So a lot of the fundamental mistakes just come from that, like not having a proper grip. I think it's exactly a similar situation here. Uh, getting comfortable of playing this, it's super important for you, okay? I know it may feel a little bit scary to have a double pawn that at first it may seem a little bit vulnerable, but you have to really understand that. At the very least, if you need to defend it, there is G3. There is genuinely nothing to be afraid of. And having these pawns, it's really restricting our opponent from pushing e5 and uh, ever activating. So, uh, okay. Now, my opponent has just played the move knight b to d7. And this is a key moment. It is just such a critical detail. Because a lot of players would either go knight e5, rook e1, queen e2. They would just play random moves. Because... You're not asking yourself, okay, what is the point behind my opponent's last move? Now, the idea is that with knight d7, black is pretty much preparing c5. And when c5 is getting played, uh, then it could get pretty ugly. They may go even further with c4. So if you have the time and you notice that opponent is taking uh, time to prepare c5, well, you got to be able to meet it with c3. So that, okay, on c4, you can keep this juicy diagonal for the bishop. So I'm going to go knight 2 and I'll explain. Knight 2 prepare c3. So uh, also it's maneuvering this knight uh, towards the king's side where it's going to be uh, way more useful. 
And just in general, in these type of positions, opponent will castle short and the bishop is super important on this diagonal. That is why on c5, you don't want to allow c4 and uh, that's going to drive your bishop onto a more like a, a passive square. No, you want to be able to keep it on this diagonal, okay? So he is castling. I'm just going to start with c3. I'm not even going to wait for him to play c5. Uh, it's like he could play it, uh, he could not. We don't really care. c3 is still a very useful move. And okay, we do have knight e4, which is an interesting move. It's an interesting try. Now, I think the standard play is knight g3, and he's going to be going for uh, f5. Let's see, knight g3. If he takes, we're happy to like just take towards the center, stick with the rule. Uh, but he plays f5, of course, getting the, let's say, so-called Pillsbury knight, if I'm not mistaken. But it is not an amazing version for him because, well, first of all, you don't want to take. That is definitely what you don't want to do because he's going to be getting a nasty fork. I know it's kind of tempting as a beginner to do that. But you don't want to take this way either because uh, he's going to have a double attack. So in order to completely counter the Pillsbury Knight while you are playing this, uh, let's say, uh, Boa Constrictor in the Jabava London, you want to be able to kick this knight by playing f3. So I could do knight e5 and then f3, or I could move this knight and then play f3. Which one should we go for? If I go here, takes, takes, f3, let's say in case it does nothing, takes, takes, I can play f4, king f2. Kind of like slow, positional play. I think that's okay. It's pretty one-sided. I think we're gonna go for it. I think it's pretty nice, pretty risk free to play. Uh, although, yeah, knight d2, I think, was definitely an alternative to, like, keep this square available. Like, uh, normally you'd love to have the open file and pressure on, uh, let's say, the backward pawn. But I think this is not minimizing our advantage uh, at all just even this position as you will see that will probably get on the board where all the knights uh, oops all the knights are getting traded off just because we're having the superior bishop it is gonna be uh quite a lot to play with uh it's gonna be quite a lot of um you know room uh, to maneuver these positions so okay he plays f4 now i really hate that f4 is hanging upon can you take that back opponent? Can you like not hang a pawn? It would have been way more instructive if you would have taken here. Perhaps I can even take with the F pawn and then go G4. Just uh, highlighting uh, the good against bad bishop. Uh, all right. All right, all right, all right. We should just take one for and pretty much punish him. That is just free win uh, after that. Uh, it's not only like uh, the extra pawn, but it's going to be a Schweitzer here, okay? There's just such a vulnerable diagonal. It's uh, a mistake that can happen simply because, uh, let's say, he felt like the Pillsbury Knight is so strong. The Pillsbury Knight is unstoppable on e4 to the point where, uh, okay, he just... Genuinely uh, lost track of the position completely uh, just because of that uh, false sense of safety that I notice it's a common pattern, uh, especially in uh, low rated games. It's quite easy to forget about that because once you have it in your brain that uh, your knight is so solid, I mean, <laughs> you feel like it's going to be like that even 20 moves later sometimes. Uh, I'm not exaggerating, but okay, still... Need to watch out for some card play, because if, let's say, you were to play bishops d2, that could easily lose, right? Like, uh, let's say, if you allow something like f3, g3, queen h3, well, congrats, uh, you managed to <laughs> lose with style. Uh, so, can I just play g3 myself? No, that would be a horrific move, Alex Banzer. I don't know why would you play that after fg if you take the bishop is hanging, so let's not do that. Okay, can I play queen to it? Oh, 
this tactic would be so brilliant, but I don't think he will play it. Let's hope he goes g5. Bishop d7 is uh, a good move, but let's hope he plays g5. We may win in brilliant fashion if he plays g5. I got a very cool trick that I want to show you, but he's probably going to play bishop d7, which, uh, yeah, I mean, we can just play normal move. Now, on g5, picture this. Let's say we can play g3. And after pawn takes, there would have been this amazing queen sack. Queen takes on f8. And then you take back, very important, with the f pawn. Discovery check from the rook. Queen is under attack. King has to move. We take the queen and then we will be having an extra rook in the final position. That would have been pretty sweet. But after bishop to d7, uh, okay, can I simply go g3? Let me do a little bit of math. Uh, okay, 2 plus 2, that's 4. Minus 1, that's 3. Uh, okay. g3 takes... Uh, can I take with the f pawn? Rook f3, gh. We get double pawns, but the smog kind of clarifies uh, a little bit. Uh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I could play that. It's like I don't really have to. You know what I mean? I'm just going to play h3. Kind of like a simple move, preparing queen g4, offering the queen trade. Whenever you're having the extra pawn, things are like a little bit complicated. You gotta simplify it, okay? If you feel like uh, <laughs> the room is heating, just exit the kitchen, dude. I don't know how you didn't think of that. Position is messy, three the queens. Or you're having an extra pawn. Exchange the queens, queen g4, blackmailing him with a trade, threatening queen g6, infiltrating. The conversion will be uh, way simpler. Uh, okay, hopefully he takes so that uh, we can play a little bit of an endgame. Now... I usually get uh, asked this a lot by players around like let's say 1000, 1200 within that rating range. Uh, okay, we do have an extra pawn for the time being. And I often get asked, okay, but we're just having an extra pawn. Are you like for real we're winning? Do you like really winning winning? Aren't you like exaggerating a little bit? Like dude, yes, you have one pawn. You straight all the pieces. Easy win. Still, I've been kind of promoting this uh, gameplay for a while by now. But for some reason, people still kind of underestimate the power of, uh, let's say, having an extra pawn simply and then converting it. So, okay, he may be willing to do that. I don't think I can put enough pressure. So I'm just going to bring my king towards the uh, center of the board. Remember that uh, in every end game, uh, the king plays a huge uh, attacking role. Okay, imagine uh, it's like uh, a football match and uh, let's say you only have uh, one attack left. You know, they always uh, bring, uh, when there is nothing to lose, the goalkeeper uh, goes uh, inside the enemy uh, penalty area for like a corner or something. So similarly here, our king is going to go bananas, ready to play king c5 and activate. While the enemy king is, uh, yeah. Not doing much, but almost jerking off on g7. Gonna go king c5. Could take there as well. I like king c5 better. My king is better than yours. Ready to play rook b1, rook b6. Use the open file. If he takes, I'm gonna get uh, even uh, stronger control over the center. There we have it. If h5, I'm gonna take and then play rook h1. Trading rooks. I'm just about to play king e6 and then pretty much win the house. Also, uh... Whenever you're having this uh, double rook endgame and you're ahead, if you're looking to minimize card play, just trade a pair of rooks and then the rest is easy. Uh, and this is simply because with two rooks on the board, black would have some uh, mechanisms to deliver perpetual check. Okay, even down like a few pawns, there are some ways to perpetual check, like on the seventh uh, or second rank to be more precise. So just gonna do this, gonna trade the rook, and then it's just a clinical finish. King is way more active. Okay, his king is just a bit late to the party. And uh, yeah, trade a pair of rooks. Rest is easy. The rest should be easy. Rook b7, take. One opponent. Okay, h5. 
aspiring for some counterplay. Interesting. Hmm. Do I want to play Rook H1? Do I want to take? I feel like Rook H1. I, I, I need to be a little bit careful. I may have... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, given him some chances, but I'm going to keep uh, improving my position. I think he's still uh, going to be stuck pretty soon. And, uh, you know, that's never ending well. <laughs> so, uh, rook h3, rook b3, maybe one of the ideas. <laughs> okay, so he wants uh, f3. I'm just going to stop that idea. He played rook f8 so that he can push. I'm going to stop it. Now, the only problem is that whenever I want to push d5, he will take with a discovery. So, the only kind of maybe inaccuracy that I could have made earlier... Oh, never mind. I just played this perfectly. You know why? Because now I can swing my rook over, trade, and he will not be in time to push, because my rook will be from b3 both supporting uh, rook b7, but also stopping any idea of counterplay. Okay. Let me not criticize my technique this time, okay? Maybe next time. But for now, look. He's not in time. Like F3, I'm just taking it and I'm winning the pawn. He just has no moves because if he takes, I take with check. So I think we got it all under control. I may be a little bit proud about this game. Okay, I think this is instructive. Getting this king. Okay, F3. That's not good, dude. Okay, take. Oh, wait a second. Am I... So I wanted to do this, but I just realized he will get the... Uh, he will get a little bit of something. Wait a minute, are we getting bamboozled? Alright guys, we might be getting bamboozled. I didn't think of this as an, uh, as an option, but I think we can easily stop this pawn. And in the same time, we're getting like a gazillions of pawns in the center. So this should be pretty good. I think we're still Gucci. D6 is a huge threat. Uh, okay. So here. Boop. King D7, I check. Okay, King there. Uh, can I take promotes D7? Check. That doesn't work. I have to go back. Okay. All right, so yeah, e6 is simple, rook h3, I may be in the checkmating zone already, yeah, I think we're in checkmating zone, I'm, uh, I'm gonna explain, so I think I can go rook h3, d7, and then rook b8, yeah, that's checkmating zone, this is a nice, uh, actually we get to show so many uh, instructive teams, Pretty crazy, so I'm gonna do this to avoid the check. Uh, his rook move is pointless because it's not supporting the pawn. Now my king uh, goes even deeper, so... Yeah, he kind of failed to get the most out of it, but I'll show you right after the game. The uh, critical sequence uh, we would have had. Now d7 is a move. Okay, he's gonna play rook d2 still, but... Uh, yeah, I should actually like speed up a little bit. How is this not like completely winning yet? Okay, so just uh, this should be easy now. Okay, five seconds. I gotta speed up. <laughs> gotta speed up with this. I play rook h7 as a primo or queen. Okay, queening next. Got that as a pre move. Okay, four seconds. Come on, opponent. Don't spoil uh, such beautiful technique. Can we get it? Four seconds only. I will scrap my pants. Come on. Don't edge me like that. You got two minutes. Don't stop. Keep making moves so I can mate you. Here. And if they're coming next, no matter what he plays, it's going to be a check. Hopefully he doesn't go to the center. 
Okay, he goes to the side and this is gonna be made next, okay. Now, you can choose the worst way, the not so uh, accurate uh, defense. Like for him, it would have been better to try like this, right? Try and promote the pawn where. Uh, especially in these kind of end games, a very critical idea is that whoever promotes first will normally deliver mate. It doesn't uh, matter that, let's say, both sides are promoting, but it more matters, uh, you know, who has the tempo. So the point to promote here very fast would have been d7. And king c7? And, you know, if e7 he takes, so how the heck do you make progress? Well, it turns out, I think, well, maybe even rook b7 check works as a deflection. But in the game, I was thinking rook b8 is even stronger. So the point is, okay, he cannot promote because of mate. And after he does that, okay, whenever you have the tempo, it's just going to be a win by force. I mean, generally anything wins, but uh, to kind of give you an example, uh, let's say something like this, and then maybe even e7, it's like you're going to promote the second pawn and uh, that is going to be made. So, yeah, overall, I think this was actually pretty well played. You guys should really rewind this sequence. Pretty much uh, what won us the game and uh, what is the move that uh, most people uh, would have, let's say, maybe not gone for so quickly is this idea to genuinely bring your king uh, closer. Right? You saw how impactful this king was. Okay, remember, just like the goalkeeper in soccer. You bring the goalkeeper, who knows? The goalkeepers are usually strong. Maybe not super, like, well coordinated, <laughs> but they can score a header. So... Our king uh, was able to do the uh, final breakthrough, remember, so that you can avoid counterplay in such endgames. Trade a pair of rooks and then the rest should be uh, manageable. Okay, do not play rook takes on f3, which I was about to do. <laughs> then this would be a pretty uh, bad way uh, to end uh, such a beautiful game. So, uh, but everybody, hope you remember how to deal with this uh, bishop to d6 uh, move. Just uh, let them take on f4, just embrace the double f pawn structure and squeeze your opponent like uh, the boa snake, like the boa constrictor, okay? You really want to remember that, um, okay? Never play bishop g3 or that kind of thing. Just play e3, embrace this structure and uh, what if they never take? Well, in case you would have played like knight f6, bishop d3, castle... Let's say something uh, very typical would be, okay, in case of something like queen c7, well, he's threatening to take here and win a pawn. Now, pretty much you got the perfect setup for your pieces to deliver e4 break. Now, e4 right away would be dropping the bishop. I don't know why would you do that. So, first, you're gonna solve that issue by taking and then e4. Threatening e5 and white is simply better because of the uh, edge in the center. Okay, sometimes you can even uh, play rook e1 first with the idea that in some position you could take with a rook. But even taking with a bishop is nice. But sometimes uh, you can get that extra, uh, let's say, detail of uh, pushing e4. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, the fact that uh, you can get something like this and then swing the rook over could... Uh, bring a lot of extra attacking ideas to your position so uh yeah i've been really studying all kinds of positions like this uh, for the course so uh, i genuinely believe this is like the best way of playing as white so uh yeah with that being said i think we can just move on to the following game all right everybody another day another game with the white pieces gonna open it up with d4 and uh, okay let's hope we get some more uh, more of a standard jubava london game Gonna go uh, knight to c3 first, and uh, then bishop to f4. Okay, my plan plays a bit of a strange move order. And I'm saying that it's a bit of a strange move order precisely because it gives us the opportunity of transposing back into the French defense by playing e4. Now, are we interested in playing the French defense? Hell no, because... The French defense is a 1e4 opening, so normally arises after e6, d4, d5, and 
if you play knight c3, you can reach the position that I mentioned. So, the nice thing as a Jabava London player is that you don't have to worry about such things, okay? You can just be a good boy or girl and play the move bishop to f4. And okay, this is already like a bit of an interesting uh, spot. Because I really used to this uh, knight b5 move. You may have seen it in uh, previous videos. And it's definitely a very dangerous and uh, sound move. But I've been like doing a lot of research these days. And from my experience of, uh, let's say, working with a lot of people uh, between 1000 to like 1800. This is a little bit confusing, like uh, I notice uh, more often than not, they forget to play this move or they don't know when to play it exactly. So can I figure out, okay, why not make it a little bit easier and just play E3? I'm thinking to make this uh, the main recommendation uh, in my upcoming Jabava course, especially uh, for players uh, below 1500. Okay, if you think you can remember Knight B5, uh, I think we'll have it given as an alternative. So uh, the bread and butter will be e3. And now my opponent goes bishop to b4, which uh, I think it's actually uh, already great news. You're probably pretty excited about this because from my experience, this is the uh, nemesis for most players. Okay, they're like really afraid of this bishop. They play bishop b4, they're painting the knight. Uh, you know, it's like uh, when it's raining outside and uh, it feels like all the drivers uh, forget uh, how to hold the steering wheel properly. Everybody is just acting like a total idiot. So, first of all, you want to notice that Black is having a pretty annoying uh, threat. Alright? They really want to play Knight to E4. Pretty much uh, doubling up uh, the pressure on the Knight. So, a lot of the times, um, the main mistake that people are doing while trying to remember theory, they think, all right, I need to remember my own moves instead of first checking out what their opponent is playing because your moves are mainly going to be dictated by uh, what your opponent does. I know it sounds obvious, but trust me, you have no idea how often this happens. So... Now you notice, okay, knight e4 is a threat, then bishop d3 is very logical, all right? Knight e4, not only that you can take it, and that's just pretty easy, uh, you can also play uh, the move uh, knight uh, g to e2. Simply defending your knight, if it takes, you take back with the knight, bishop takes, pawn takes, and uh, white is already better thanks to the bishop pair, opponent's bishop is stuck inside the pawn chain, and uh, well... Uh, you can already, uh, let's say, if he castles, you have ideas to attack him on the king side with uh, queen h5 uh, type of stuff. You g6, move the queen, push the pawn, many different lines, okay? I don't want to, like, go too deep in that. But he plays c5, which is, like, by far the most important move, okay? I'm saying it is the most important move because uh, it will transpose to one of the most standard positions for the whole Jabava. And pretty much the logic behind this move is that whenever they go c5, they are threatening to play c4, pretty much forcing this bishop onto a pretty dodgy diagonal. So you don't want that. And whenever c4 is being threatened, you're going to go dc. Very important, okay? Make sure to really learn this move orders by heart because the rest is easy. Okay, queen a5. Pretty much uh, the first moment the uh, opponent kind of deviates from uh, what I've been uh, used to. <sighs> Alright, I gotta put my uh, thinking cap here for a little bit. I got simple move uh, 92. The question is uh, whether uh, we should consider just gambiting the pawn with like knight f3. Allowing him to take and then take with the queen. I don't think we need to allow that. You know what? I don't think we need to allow that at all. So, I'm just gonna go uh, knight to e2. I'm playing knight e2 only if I really have to defend on c3. Ideally, this knight goes to f3. 
So I, I just want to bring that one up here because I know it's like a common mistake. People tend to overplay this knight too. So no, it's only notice that he has all these pieces lined up. Uh, knight e2 was required. Otherwise, I would have uh, played it on f3, controlling, uh, let's say, the center uh, better, <laughs> pretty much. So, okay, knight there, I think uh, a3 should be a good move, pretty much forcing him to take, uh, give us the bishop here, because a3, bishop c5 loses a piece to b4. So I'm just gonna cash in the bishop pair. And then I'm expecting him to go uh, queen takes on c5, simply winning back the pawn. If e5, I think that's perhaps inaccurate because of perhaps b4, little intermezzo, but potentially uh, keeping back the extra pawn. I just need to calculate whether he can go knight b4 there. But yeah, he, he will definitely play queen c5, way uh, easier, no need to risk it as, uh, as black. And okay, what do we have here? What is up with this position? I think castling is very normal. Also, uh, considering the fact that uh, opponent may be uh, playing e5 on the next move followed by e4, you could consider pushing it here. But I think I'm just going to start uh, with castle. I'm going to keep it very simple. Okay, I think e5, uh, okay. Big moment. Because uh, it's a big moment since uh, we have two moves. Bishop g3. Or bishop g5. Pause the video and uh, try to understand what is the better move. Because it is way more important that in such scenario, okay, bishop g3 still keeps an eye on e5, but the bishop can get a bit more, uh, let's say, a little bit passive on that square. While bishop g5 is creating direct threat of uh, taking, doubling up the pawns, and weakening d5. So it's kind of doing two things at once. It's important to understand that and uh, try to generally uh, multitask with your pieces. So, uh, expecting something like maybe bishop e6. I think it's just too slow for him to avoid the, the double pawns. Uh, and okay, he plays e4. Now, on e4, simple move would be retreating. Now, does it make sense to throw in bishop f6? Let's say he takes and then, uh, okay. At least we have managed to ruin his structure. I think uh, we can just play simple move since uh, this very much remains a threat. It's not like he could move the knight because uh, the pawn remains hanging. And uh, yeah, I think uh, since taking the knight followed by queen d5 is such a monster threat, he may have to play bishop e6. But notice that without really realizing... Uh, Black has uh, created uh, sort of a backward pawn for himself. Like, he played a bunch of active moves. It feels like, uh, you know, it felt like he's making so many uh, tempo moves that logically he's making steps in the right direction. But in fact, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> okay, white is just uh, very comfortable. We just need to find a proper way to arrange our pieces and... Uh, play around those weaknesses. Okay, I can take. I don't have to rush since maybe he could get some attack. So I'm going to start knight b5, preparing to play knight d4, just kind of uh, making sure he doesn't play d4. Because I think uh, potentially he could trade his weakness. So knight b5, okay. Also, uh, <laughs> threatening a fork. But mainly uh, it's played for the strategic reason of controlling the d4 square. And uh, potentially, I could play knight 4 next move, I could play c3 knight 4 Okay, he goes queen b6, which uh, also allows a check, among other things. Um, what should we play? I could also do c4. c4 is interesting. Opening up the position while uh, his king is actually not so secure, because his king is in the middle. There's a very important concept that uh, you should look for ways to open up the position. So I think it's best to, uh, yeah, stick with simple play, c4. And the point is that after dc, I've got at the very least knight d6. 
If King e7, I have knight takes on e4 at the very least, uh, taking, a, taking advantage of the pin. So, okay, he plays rook to d8, creating a bit of an annoying uh, idea. Now, because this is a threat, I kind of wonder uh, whether we can play c5. If queen takes, we have the check. I'm not saying the check is necessarily uh, devastating, but we also have the opportunity of bringing the rook with tempo. So that's a bit interesting. It's a tempo move, it's worth checking. But uh, probably we'll have to look for uh, something different because I don't see a follow up. So uh, then, since this is annoying, probably uh, queen a4 is a good move. And after queen a4, in case of a6, we have at the very least knight d4. Simply because this knight is pinned, so yeah. I think that's pretty good. Knight d4 on the board, got the pin, has to play bishop d7 pretty much. But then after bishop to d7... Uh, yeah, here again, I'm still cannot uh, think of anything else other than this c5 move. It kind of, it's kind of uh, catching my attention more and more. But maybe it's because after bishop d7, I mean, we could also take, and after bishop takes, there is simple move, queen c2. And uh, he's still pretty much overextended uh, with his pawns, and uh, there is a threat of taking on f6. That's looming. Okay, so he unpins, forcing me to take. I'm gonna take on f6, I'm gonna take on d5, I'm gonna take on a6. He could try to take on b2, but uh, in a position where uh, material is equal, uh, we will be having the uh, so-called outside pass pawn, which is generally a huge advantage in the endgame. So for this reason, I'll try to offer a queen trade in the near future. Yeah, so expecting this. Now queen b2 just to establish material equality, and then I'm gonna play queen b5. Basically, uh, I am on my knees begging for a queen trade because if it takes, we may very well just get a free win because we have the outside passer. Now, if let's say you're a little bit confused and uh, you don't understand uh, why is the outside passer uh, such a big thing, you can compare it with uh, Bitcoin, okay? Like, initially, there are these stories that uh, people... Uh, <laughs> Uh, use their Bitcoin uh, to buy uh, some pizza, like let's say 10 years ago or uh, whenever it was invented. It's like you don't feel it's going to be a lot, but, <laughs> you know, if you could uh, do a little bit of time traveling, then you realize the potential of it. Uh, and, uh, okay, for those of you that are wondering uh, what the hell am I talking about, uh, the point is that we're going to use this pawn as a bait Let's say we trade all the pieces, right? Uh, okay, he attacks that. Let me uh, defend. Oh, no, this would uh, hang rook e2, and then my rook will be unprotected. Uh, that wouldn't be a very educational uh, gameplay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put my bishop on a protected square. Uh, but okay, the point that I'm trying to make, take all the heavy pieces off the board, right? Uh, like this. Now... White is essentially just winning because your king uh, has to stay on this side while we can uh, use our king, uh, let's say it comes like this and uh, we can just take the other pawns. So while you're busy dealing with the outside passer, we're gonna take the whole uh, other side. Uh, okay, it's a miracle if I'm not getting flagged in this game, but let's try. I'm gonna go rook b1 exchanging the rook and uh, bishop h3 uh, does uh, nothing because I have uh, bishop f1 as a nice safe move. So. Let's see. Opponent will try to uh, do his thing, uh, win on time, but I do believe that, uh, okay, we already have a pretty easy position. It kind of plays itself. We just push the pawn and it should be easy win. He has like no attack and has to babysit the pawn. Uh, we don't even have to like uh, play the end game because it seems that he tries to keep pieces on the board to, let's say, get an attack. It's not really an attack, my friend. If you guys think uh, that is an attack, well, uh, this generation has uh, gotten very soft. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Bishop to f1. Pretty much shutting these down. He has to, like, do something. I don't know why it's such a big decision. He cannot really keep, like, playing rook d2. I mean, I just push and then I play uh, rook b8 if I need to trade the rook. So that uh, just wins itself. Yeah, pawn is... Pawn is pretty much, like, uh, can advance all the way to a7. Oh, <laughs> that is free rook. He wanted to play rook g8, but uh, he forgot about it. Too bad. Now all the pieces are hanging because this is also no more pinned. <laughs> wow. Opponent managed to blunder like four pieces with one move. That is quite a performance in itself, uh, I have to say. I'm going to play rook b6, trying to cut his king. Then I'm going to promote. I should be able to get uh, the win without much trouble. Uh, despite the uh, yeah small time scramble that uh, was announced, I mean it turns out that uh, it was a fake alarm. So uh, <laughs> you know you prepare yourself uh, for rain. It's like you get uh, your umbrella, but all of a sudden you go outside and it's just a very sunny day. So <laughs> happens. Uh, yeah. Okay. Interesting moment in the opening. Uh, I kind of forgot what my analysis said here. Yeah, I don't think we had a good version to sack, so knight e2 was the best move. And then, uh, I have to say my opponent played pretty decent for uh, his rating overall. It's just that, uh, okay, this position... Uh, yeah, somehow the computer evaluates this as equal. I don't really get it but yeah for sure it was no more equal after rook b1 apparently uh, he had to find uh, rook c8 rook c2 to keep enough activity i'm curious like what uh, accuracy we're gonna get he got like a 91 i have to say my opponent played uh, very decent but uh yeah hopefully uh, you guys take note of this idea on how to deal with uh, bishop to b4, uh, pinning. First things first, you want to play bishop to d3, uh, and then on c5, threatening c4, you take. And then, okay, most normally they're going to take. And uh, here you don't play knight e2. That's the mistake that a lot of people are doing, okay? They're just like overly cautious with this knight. No, you only play there when it's required. Otherwise, uh, you prefer knight f3. Okay, Alex Vanzea, I don't really get it. I want that extra layer of safety so that I don't uh, blunder my pieces. Why should I play knight f3? Well, let's just assume black plays the most normal moves, right? Like, let's say they castle, we castle, they play knight c6. Now, I really want to remember the key move, okay? Pretty much opening Pandora's box, if you want. Just to just push the pawn to e4. And the knight on f3 can be such an effective piece because... If, let's say, our opponent uh, is not paying attention, yeah, they just ignore. Can already play a move such as e5, knight d7. And because you have the knight on f3 and not on e2, you can actually go for the Greek gift. Take knight g5 and uh, hope they go back. Okay? I'm just kidding. Uh, you're winning, nevertheless. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is now to give a deadly attack. Like, if king g6, uh, you bring the queen uh, to g3. Uh, queen g4 also good there. If king back, queen h5, queen h7. Usually leads to a mate by force. So queen e5, knight e2 because it's required, okay? They are genuinely threatening to take on c3 and defending with the queen is very dodgy. But why would you do that when you can just uh, get a smooth coordination with knight? You even avoid the double pawns. So knight e2, simple move. And then, uh, yeah, we got this position. If, let's say, he is not breaking, uh, we could play e4. Yeah, and most likely you get a game like this. Uh, okay, you have bishop pair. Um, I mean, could play, let's say, c3, queen e2, rook d1. Much easier game uh, for white. They have to, like, watch out for bishop d6. So, essentially, white is just having a much nicer time because of this bishop against their bad bishop. And e5 can be met by bishop e3. So, bishops still remain uh, very active. So the rest in the game, we pretty much, uh, yeah, 
couldn't really highlight the power of the outside passer, but if he were to trade, let's say, uh, this is just a very nice uh, typical scenario. Uh, let me show you something, guys. Okay, let's say they play rook c8. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea why this is such an important asset, like uh, trading Bitcoin for pizza. All right, like let's say, okay, we make some random moves. Yeah, like this doesn't have to be precise, but just so you get the point. Normally, like in most situations, you're going to have uh, something like this. Like the black king needs to watch out for the pawn, yeah? They need to like babysit it. And then we go king d4. So they'll try like bishop e6, whatever, defend. And here uh, we have the winning play. Yeah, we're gonna win this uh, by uh, using the outside passer. This is why uh, the pawn is so valuable uh, in such end games. okay? In all end games, it's actually valuable. So you have like rook end games, uh, knight end games, bishop end games. This pawn is just usually a monster. Because you can just, uh, let's say, sacrifice it. Okay. And now, for instance, in this very example, uh, you can use it by taking. So, at least uh, you're winning e4 as well. Right? And if he tries to defend, notice that because the king takes uh, so much time uh, to actually deal with the outside passer, he's just unable to uh, save the queen side and collect these pawns, then you have easy win. So, uh, okay. Bit of a longer analysis uh, than usual, but uh, if you guys didn't find it very boring and um, you're actually learning something, so uh, let me know in the comments. And with that being said, we can just move on to the following game. But before we move on to the following game, I really need your help, okay? Uh, some of you may remember that, uh, let's say, kind of like a month ago, I've asked for your vote. Uh, onto the Chessable Awards, in case you own uh, my Karo Khan course. It turns out that was actually a thing made for chess.com, and now we have the real Chessable Awards, so to speak. Uh, and you can do that by logging in into your Chessable account. Here you have uh, Chessable Awards, you can click on this. Um, anyways, I'll let uh, a link in the description, in case that's kind of hard to find, I guess. And you just have to take on the survey. Uh, yeah, you can kind of skip these ones if you don't know what to vote. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can vote me if uh, <laughs> you think that's appropriate. I'm not trying to uh, influence that in any way. I'm just trying to give you a reminder that, uh, hey, this would really help. So for instance, okay, here you reach just about the course of the year. You can see that uh, my <laughs> little goofy art pops uh, out here. So if you click on it, uh, then yet again, I'm not going to be here. If you have other, vote for them. If don't, uh, if not, skip. Best opening course for black. I need that as well. Uh, let's say trying to kill two birds with one stone. And uh, yeah, I think that is pretty much it. Finish the survey. It's going to have like a few more. And uh, then you just have to press submit. Okay, make sure you make it to the bottom so uh, you submit your vote. And uh, okay, thanks a lot for your support, guys. You have no idea how much uh, this helps me. And uh, again, just do that in case you own my course. Don't try to like blackmail the vote or anything like that. So with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. You know, putting up with d4 and uh, we're starting to climb a little bit of reading. And my opponent is playing the Benoni. As a rule of thumb, whenever they play c5 and you can push, that will be the best move. Now, kind of like the sad part about it is that uh, you can no longer play uh, a Jopava London. Pretty disappointing, I know. But, on the bright side, white is generally much better, simply because we have uh, more space. So, uh, hey, I don't think it will really hurt your chess development if you learn how to take advantage of this extra space. So, um, okay, opponent plays knight of six, and um, pretty much the key idea in these positions uh, to get uh, started with is not to play c4, okay? Well, in this position it hangs upon, but say uh, earlier you could play c4, right? This is very important. 
Because a lot of people just, uh, let's say, don't pay attention to the move, uh, let's say, third move, right? It's like you ask somebody what is their name and then you forget uh, to listen to the actual name. So that is why it's so critical to pay attention for this move orders because otherwise you could uh, be completely missing the boat. So e4, knight f6, knight c3, okay? Knight in front of the pawn. Opponent goes e6 and, uh, okay. He is playing kind of like uh, an old Benoni, I think it's called. Uh, there are many ways of Benoni, like uh, e5 at some point, like uh, earlier. In this position, it's called uh, the Czech Benoni. Whatever Benoni you hear, it's usually a red flag. Okay, it's pretty bad. So stay away from the Benoni if you can, right? So 93 e6, you have many ways of playing this. Uh, However, my favorite is to avoid uh, this structure when they take and I have to take with a pawn. I like to keep that, that square for a piece. So I usually take and uh, he has two ways, pawn takes or uh, bishop takes. In case of bishop takes, I like to maneuver the knight uh, to f4, fighting for this square. And in case he would have gone uh, fe, I play knight f3, bishop f4. And then uh, e5 uh, comes in uh, really strong. It's pretty much uh, completely disturbing his position. Um, so takes with the bishop. I'm going to go knight e2. That's pretty much still theory. Uh, I have this uh, in my uh, mentioned in my London system course. So I'm just going to follow my own advice, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much where my knowledge stops. Um, okay, if you sometimes think, uh, all right, how can I ever play a good game? Like these guys know all their first 20 moves and I mean, it's going to take me a lifetime to even remember the first 10 moves. Mm, well, that may be the case sometimes, but in general, okay, like <laughs> my philosophy and uh, especially how I'm preparing uh, these openings uh, to teach you is that you only need like uh, the first 10 to 12, 15 moves. Okay, uh, it's very rarely that you need to remember all the 15 moves first. Um, then just a few plans and then you pretty much get started with a very little theory. You just, uh, you're just going to be able to uh, figure out uh, the best plan uh, on your own. So, uh, okay, how do you do that? First of all, uh, you are watching out for your opponent's frats. Okay, queen a5. He's doing random queen move. Well, I mean, he, he's clearly pinning the knight and he wants to steal a pawn. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, even at this level, they are going for uh, cheap tricks. Now, on general grounds, taking the bishop is pretty good. Um, I mean, always uh, trading your knights for your opponent's bishop is uh, a positive trade. So... I'm considering knight takes and uh, also I'm considering f3 to defend. I would like to develop quickly. So uh, developing with tempo, it's something you should really aim for if possible. And that would be with uh, taking and then bishop c4, attacking the weak pawn. Now it's not very easy for him to defend. So perhaps he could try knight e4. But I really think that uh, even after something like castles, say knight c3, pawn c3, uh, we should have great compensation. Like maybe he pushes d5, attacking the bishop, but uh, just kind of like by intuition in such positions, bishop d5, e d5, sacrificing a piece uh, should be very interesting. Mm, not super sure about the piece sacrifice, so uh, we'll try to, let's say, uh, cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay, so bishop c4. Developing with tempo. And on knight e4, I don't have to castle, okay? I can also go bishop e6. Now, after bishop e6, pretty much the calculation gets easier. He has knight c3, pawn c3, and then queen c3. And as you can see, that pretty much targets both the king and the rook. So in order to defend, bishop d2 is the only move. He's going to have to play probably queen e5. Checking uh, my uh, king and the bishop on e6. So the only move for me to defend both would be queen e2. The problem is that uh, we will have a hanging rook that he can take with check. 
So that is usually a bad sign. Uh, all right. So, uh, okay. I was guessing this should be easy move. Uh, let me do another, uh, let's say another check before we move on to something else. Okay. Another counter attacking move, right? So we went over castle. Uh, I've mentioned takes and then D five. It's kind of complicated. Mm. How about queen g4 right away? Targeting this and targeting e6. Like queen g4, kind of forcing knight c3, and then um, the queen takes on e6. Like assuming he plays bishop e7, which is like the most normal move ever. Uh, well, maybe even now we can weirdly castle. And it's like his knight is almost trapped and his king is kind of caught in the middle. So I'm gonna go queen g4. It is not an easy move to find. But it looks to be pretty crushing. So, as you can see, I'm pretty much just kind of following sound chess principles. And then I'm trying to pretty much uh, uh, find it as we go. It's not like I'm trying to see everything in advance. So, I'm just making uh, simple decisions with each move. So, I'm going to go intermediate move. Take that to check. And now, if I take, we both figured uh, it out a second ago that he's winning the rook. So we need to get the heck out of there. Now I could castle or I could play the safer bishop d2, right? If I don't want to be lazy, I just, uh, I mean, if I want to be lazy, <laughs> which, hey, maybe even uh, better, I can play bishop d2, which is pin this knight, making sure that uh, we're going to win back some material at least. Important that uh, his king is stuck in the middle. Like, uh, queen is controlling both castling squares for the king, so that would simply be illegal. And, yeah, he plays knight d4, which is uh, technically a good try, but I have simple move, yeah? Check, just uh, avoiding the threat, and then we can take. So this is going to come uh, with a double attack. Now targeting both the king and the knight, uh, the queen and the knight, and setting up a trap. Because it looks very tempting to... Going for the check, let's say. But then, uh, I'm not sure if my opponent is uh, going to be able to uh, take advantage of that uh, pot of gold on the A1 square. Because I have king d2, and all of a sudden, both the knight and, more importantly, the queen will be under attack. So... He cannot actually take on c2. He has to move the queen. And uh, okay, <laughs> the second I say he cannot, he does it. Maybe opponent knows better. Is he gonna go knight b4 self pinning? Is opponent into that? I mean, I don't wanna judge him, but I kinda want to in the same time. So, okay. Queen a4, <laughs> this definitely looks bad for him. All the pieces are loose. So, uh, it is uh, gonna be your turn to. Uh, find a way to take advantage of this. So please feel free to pause the video and find the best move for white. There are many good moves, I would say, but probably the easiest is B3. Breaking this connection uh, between the queen and the knight. It's like uh, opponent is uh, going to, uh, let's say, visit uh, or hike in the mountains and he's losing uh, signal to the Wi-Fi. Now, <laughs> because of that, He's no longer able to stay in touch with the knight. So we're going to be taking it. And uh, that is pretty much going to give us uh, a free win according to all rules of chess. Hopefully. And uh, yeah, also hopefully you find this somewhat instructive. Um, because um, we're trying to break down uh, my thinking process here, like let's say bit by bit. And uh, hopefully it's not, uh, let's say, as intimidating as, um, let's say, many people have this kind of misconception that you need to see a hundred moves in advance to play a decent chess game. <laughs> no, it's just, you kind of need to stay away from, like, uh, most moments when a disaster can happen. And then, I mean, it's a lot of process of elimination. Uh, I can do bishop d5 now. Centralizing my bishop, targeting the queen. I can also do queen g7, but that hangs the f2 pawn, so I don't want to give him any bit of counterplay. 
If I do this, you can check I have bishop d3 back. This also looks very reasonable, to be honest. So I guess I'll just try to uh, double up on the seventh rank. Uh, so yeah, it's important to watch out for your opponent's checks. Uh, I had this prepared and uh, rook takes on g7 is going to come next. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, at the end of the day, the trickiest part with, uh, let's say, uh, putting all the pieces of the puzzle uh, together, let's say like playing a good game uh, in and out, is uh, being able to evaluate, let's say, the upcoming positions and all that. So uh, that is something that you're going to get better at in time, but... Yeah, as you can see, just by following the basics, uh, I mean, call me crazy, but I think it's something that you guys uh, can uh, aim for uh, with a bit of practice. So, uh, okay, Rook there, try and counterplay. I'm just going to pin him, so we avoid uh, any tricks. And uh, yeah, that's kind of like a nice move. Without that, it could have gotten a little bit messy, but after this, it's just uh, like in football, you know? It's like... Uh, Opponent, uh, I mean, your teammate sends like a long cross and then you manage to stop the ball uh, on your chest. Now he's trying to use the x-rays, thinking the rook uh, defends the queen uh, through my queen. However, who laughs in the end has the better laugh <laughs> because he forgot uh, that he's pinned. Thus, the queen blunder happened. So, okay, he just takes. I need to bring my last piece into the game. Usually exchanging uh, whenever you are ahead is the way to go. Uh, it will generally just make the transition uh, way better. And uh, I mean, make the transition better and simpler. It's actually what I meant to say. So, okay, just gonna go queen e3 as my queen was attacked and I wanna do this next. So we're putting pressure on uh, the bishop. Fully mating him, I only have 30 seconds left and this is not an increment game. Taking c7. Uh, it's Black Friday, but uh, with the bishops. So I'm going to be taking that. Uh, King is trying to escape. That's giving another free pawn. And hey, <laughs> it was also a checkmate. I didn't see that coming. Huh, isn't this kind of like relatable? <laughs> Funny how it happens sometimes. <laughs> All right. That was, uh, that was actually pretty good. Now, for those of you that are genuinely waiting and are really curious uh, about uh, the course that I'm working on uh, with the Jubava, I'm going to give you a few details. Also, I want to thank everybody that is still watching my videos, despite the fact that I have only posted like three times in the last month, simply because um, it's just kind of like overwhelming to also make videos and courses in the same time. Uh, I really wanted to thank you. I appreciate the support. I love every single one of you watching. It is genuinely surreal to have almost uh, 100,000 returning viewers in the past 30 days. Uh, so, yeah, truly grateful for everybody that watches and seems to enjoy my content. So, uh, that is that. And uh, for those of you that are wondering, okay, what the hell are you doing with the course? What is it not coming out? Where are you going to publish? Uh, sort of things like that. Uh, well, first of all, I would say like an estimated uh, time for when it will be ready. Uh, I think we can say it should be roughly around like two months from uh, now. I have made considerable progress. Uh, I think it's going to have sort of uh, like a similar look to the uh, Karo Khan course. If you guys uh, already own it, uh, the Karo Khan course has uh, 150 trainables. Uh, for now, this is going to have a bit of a different structure since it's not going to be on chessable. But uh, I would say it's going to be roughly around uh, 100 trainables. This is going to be the simplified version of the course. But uh, it will also have, uh, let's say, more in-depth uh, PGN files. Uh, if you guys want more details, uh, the goal of it is just to also have simplified version uh, for the newer players because otherwise it's super easy to get uh, overwhelmed uh, in, you know, so many details. Uh, so once again, really love the support. Appreciate every single one of you that is watching and uh, I'll try to keep up with this uh, with these videos while also working uh, on the course and uh, I'm probably going to make uh, make an update on the community page uh, on YouTube once I make uh, more progress and uh, I'll let you guys know. 
it's tricky to estimate a time frame since it's kind of like a creative job. Uh, I'm trying to really bring the course to life and not just give, uh, let's say, this typical chess analysis only. So I um, really appreciate your patience and uh, I'll see you guys around on the channel. Take care.